So in the last video, we had seen how uh, mode solutions from Lumerical can be used to design uh, waveguides. And we especially saw it in the context of uh, LiDAR based applications. Uh, and we saw that how the distance between waveguides can be um, sort of decided so that a very small amount of or almost no light from one waveguide leaks into the other. All these kind of analysis can be done using mode. Uh, in this video, we'll see uh, what FDTD can do and what kind of plots it can generate. And uh, again, we'll see it in the context of LiDAR. So, uh, so if you if you remember uh, uh, in in the last in the last video we had discussed about um, corrugated waveguides as antennas, and that's what we see here again. And uh, I think I don't think we discussed the part where uh, how is uh, the separation of these this corrugation for a single antenna decided, and this is based on the fact that. Uh, we want the first order Bragg diffraction to scatter into free space. Um, and that's what uh, this condition equation over here gives. So here, this big lambda basically is, is the pitch between of the corrugations. And lambda zero is your design wavelength and n effective is the effective uh, refractive index of the fundamental mode inside this, inside this corrugated waveguide. Um, uh, so, normally this condition defines uh, uh, the procedure where after the first order diffraction, uh, the light scattered uh, is emitted normal to the plane of the waveguide. But uh, that can create some other complications because basically this light will be emitted both in the up and the bottom direction and then due to multiple ref reflections, it can cause interference patterns and uh, uh, those kind of effects we don't we sort of want to neglect and that that's the reason we choose uh, practically a value of uh, big lambda to be slightly more uh, than what we get here so uh, that's what we will do and so let's move to the fdtd file which we have here uh, and i'll just briefly describe uh, the structure and the layout so as i had discussed last time for the mode solutions as well so we will be discussing um, waveguides which are surrounded by silicon so here if you see there is actually a silicon uh, substrate on top of that you have this uh, box this is essentially a silica layer and then on top of this there is the silicon waveguide if you see here and uh, i'll describe this these other parameters uh, in just a bit and then on top of this again we have a silica uh, sort of capping layer so your your waveguides are basically surrounded by silica on all the sides so uh, if yeah, i'll just zoom this a bit and Let's see, maybe I can switch this off or disable it for now. Mm. Okay. Um. All right, so uh, if you look closely here, we have actually uh, shown three waveguides. Uh, so this is the central waveguide, which acts um, as your source waveguide. So uh, we'll be launching a mode source here. So that will launch basically the, the fundamental mode of this waveguide, uh, the uncorrugated um, fundamental uh, the fundamental mode of the uncorrugated part of the waveguide and that's then launched in, into uh, this waveguide uh, antenna region and the waveguide antenna consists of uh, these multiple waveguides and then these sections 
A, B, if you see, they are the, the actual corrugations. And this can be actually created by writing a script, as has been done in this case. And then uh, I'll also show you what the monitors are. So uh, there is actually a field monitor, which is ke kept very close to the waveguides. Uh, if you see in the in the XZ view, uh, and the reason it's kept close is that it should be close enough so that it can capture the near fields, and uh, later in the uh, in the analysis, this fa this near fields obtained can be used to do a far field projections projection to calculate or look at how the far fields uh, will look like. So uh, I'll then show you the the results which can be obtained from this kind of simulations. So, okay, the first thing is something which can be seen is uh, by measuring the transmission by keeping a monitor at the end of the waveguide. And uh, so basically, again, like we have a launch in the beginning and then you can act, then you measure the transmission at the end of the waveguide. And then you can see plots like this. So basically we want to see that we are in the wavelength of interest, there is a fair amount of transmission. So which is the wavelength of interest in our case is from 1.5 to 1.6 micron. And the band gap region lies further away from that. So, so in that sense, it's good. And so that means there will be uh, sufficient scattering, successive scattering from the different perturbations uh, into free space. Um, so here we have generated plots are the far field plots for a single antenna. And this has been done by using the fields obtained by uh, the near field monitor, which I had described and doing a far field projection. And this can be done using uh, a script or just far field uh, settings of the, uh, the DFT monitor itself. Um, so here you will see that uh, uh, we have basically a polar plot and uh, the X and the Y directions are plotted. Uh, so one thing to note in Lumerical is that uh, the theta and the phi directions uh, or the angles uh, in of, of the spherical polar coordinates are sort of replaced. So in, in Lumerical, the angle theta is the angle made by, uh, the angle made by the Z axis with your, uh, the position vector, so to speak and the phi value lies in the uh, xy plane. So here you have the ux and uy, and these angles are along the circle are uh, the phi values. And uh, these contours here basically represent the values of uh, theta. So these are the far field plots for a single antenna. And we see that even already for uh, the different values of lambda, uh, the scattering has different values of both phi and theta. So there is already a bit of uh, inherent uh, scattering um, or sorry, steering in uh, in even a single antenna. So by basically tuning the value of lambda, you can actually uh, change the direction of your beam. But uh, we can do much more than that uh, and that's what a LiDAR does is by uh, setting relative phases between different antennas of an array, you can actually make this into a concentrated beam and uh, steer it for different values of theta and phi. And that's what we see here in the next uh, plot, which can also be uh, done by uh, applying the um, LiDAR theory, LiDAR analysis based on uh, array factor analysis to calculate uh, uh, how the fields look like if there is an actual array. And for this, uh, you actually don't need an array. You can do it just by the fields obtained from a single antenna as we, um, as can be obtained from the simulation file, the FDTD simulation file I've shown. 
and by writing a script to actually generate these kind of plots. So uh, as we see here, basically for different values of lambda, you get different values of theta and phi. Uh, I'll then just show you a video where you can actually see the beam steering happening. So here the beam steering is for different values of uh, theta and uh, and different values of phi as well. So uh, just as a reminder, so the phi value is along uh, the circle here and the contours basically represent different values of theta. So you can just have a look at this video. So you'll see how it's now changing the values of uh, phi from zero to 45 degrees. And then, the, then it will switch the value of uh, theta. So now it's again theta equal to uh, 10. And here you can actually see the the second order diffraction as well. So that's like the uh, the effect of the diffraction because of an array. So this is like the central lobe, and this is like the first order diffraction. Okay, so that's that's really cool, and that's what we can do just by using data obtained from FDDD analysis. In the next video, we'll see how uh, numerical interconnect can be used to sort of simulate the whole uh, system uh, of of the lidar and the whole experiment of lidar. Thank you.